is one. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just in case anybody doesn't know, um, phase one of HS2 is the leg that runs from central London, London Euston, um, north into Birmingham, Curzon Street, and then slightly further north still, just, just kind of past Litchfield. Um, it's around 200 kilometres um, in length. Um, of the width varies, but you know you could you could assume that it's around 100 metres at least in width and greater in places. Um, so essentially, this is the largest ever scheme of archaeology works, uh, certainly since the PPG 16 era, um, that ever to have taken place in the UK. So, sorry, next slide, please. So with that in mind, um, a few years ago now, we developed the Historic Environment Research and Delivery Strategy, um, you know, in response to the fact that this was such a such an unprecedented and uh, large scheme. Um, the strategy was drawn up following a series of consultation meetings with the sector, with the academic community, um, Historic England, local county stakeholders, and um, community groups as well. Um, the strategy was basically focused around three areas, knowledge creation, community engagement, and skills. And those three things have uh, underpinned um, our work on the HS2 project uh, since then. Um, and the, the, the strategy is also underpinned by a series of technical standards. So um, they mirror kind of industry standards for methodologies and um, data deliverables to um, ensure consistency um, from the work um, that's done. Uh, next slide, please. So, for the knowledge creation um, side of the strategy, um, we basically had um, a series of period based questions. Um, we had around 50. Um, some were relevant to the whole route, kind of national style kind of research questions. Others were more kind of regionally um, specific, and others were more kind of localized and site specific from um, the archaeological sites that we, we obviously knew about um, in advance of the program of work. Uh, next slide, please. So prior to um, intrusive excavation investigation work, um, um, we basically undertook a series of non-intrusive surveys. Um, the first of those was um, a scheme-wide um, LIDAR survey, which was undertaken um, really early on before the environmental statement was um, um, prepared. Um, so that um, basically detects, um, you know, micro topography and earthworks across the roots is very good at detecting things like ridge and furrow. Um, so we've, we've basically got a LIDAR um, image terrain model of the whole of the whole route. Um, geophysical surveys, some of those were done early on as part of the environmental statements. And then um, subsequently we um, essentially joined, joined the gaps and we've pretty much done 100% of the route in terms of geophysical surveys. There were some areas that might not have been accessible for various kind of logistical reasons, but it's pretty much the whole route has been surveyed with geophysics. Um, and another thing that we've um, done quite a lot of um, is um, use drones or UAVs, um, which, is, which have helped basically at the site level to um, to take an overview of individual sites to help us to kind of you know look at the site from an aerial perspective. Um, we've taken still photos, um, video, but also um, a new technology has kind of developed over the last few years, and we're also able to use these for photogrammetry, which is another way of um, creating a um, 3D uh, model of any given site. And we've used this data to actually help. Um, you know, to help aid our kind of decision making and kind of strategies at a site level um, as we've as we've gone along. So, next slide, please, and over to Emma. Really good. Thanks, John. So, um, yeah, so <clears throat> geoarchaeological and paleo environmental resources, as we know, are critical for helping to us to reconstruct histories of paleo climate, paleo vegetation, and land use. And these are really essential for helping us to understand the human interactions with the natural environment. 
So the phase one route presented us with a great opportunity to explore these linear transects across southern and middle Britain. Um, this also crosses a variety of depositional trans terrains, environments where organic rich remains may be preserved. So this was the largest geoarchaeological investigation undertaken in England to date. But prior to the bespoke programme of works, uh, we also did thousands of geotechnical ground investigations, you can see here. These took place and the logs were used as the basis of our death space assessments. Next slide, please. So the initial geoarchaeological death space assessment was undertaken by Wessex Archaeology, and this provided deposit models and geoarchaeological character zones. So these zones, um, they identified areas of high potential for the next phases of works, but we also use LIDAR, aerial photographs and historic maps to look for certain types of landforms. But also to complement this DBA, there was also a route-wide paleoenvironmental dust space assessment. And such a resource has never been attempted or undertaken on this scale in the UK, so it's really exciting for us. And the assessment of this resource helped us to develop further research questions around major themes, but also to help us to consider the value of the paleoenvironmental remains. Next slide, please. So in addition, we also used other techniques and methods. We also tested, and these were done particularly in the area around the Colne Valley. So the primary objective of these geophysical investigations in, we did in area in, in Hillington was to search for evidence of quaternary paleo channels. And here we used electromagnetic and resistivity images. So these were done on the Coptal North and the River Pin sites. So ERT, going uh, on this extremely successfully in the Trent Valley and we hope that the application and the New Year's Green Bourne could so potentially yield further results like this. So we have made of coarser sediments and gravels. Uh, so these features could potentially be and the application of these techniques really did help us further archaeological works in the area. Next slide please. So following on from um, our non-intrusive surveys and desk-based works, we also had a bespoke programme of field investigations, and these were designed across the whole of area north, central and south, helping to target areas of high potential. So methods that we used included hand augering, window sampling and geoarchaeological test pits. And one of the most successful part sites we found was at Sedgwick Farm, which is next slide, please. So the geoarchaeological test pits that were excavated here were done in order to help us to understand the extent of the uh, Pleistocene sands and whether there were any microfauna remains present. So the area around this site is really rich in evidence for prehistoric activity um, dating back from the Paleolithic. But the site is also only located 50 metres near Locks Pit. And this is a site which produced lots of Pleistocene megafauna remains, including woolly mammoth, um, Rhinoceros and Lipotamus. But the microfauna remains here on this slide um, from Cedric Farm test pits are considered to be of national significance by the Natural History Museum. So we have species of small mammal fauna, including um, northern vole, um, tundra voles, and adult nat natter jack toads. Never say that. Um, and the late glacial interstadial is probably the last time actually that these species ever occurred together in southern England. Next slide, please. So moving into the Mesolithic period, uh, the majority of our sites um, are focused in the Colne Valley. Um, and the Colne Valley previously unearthed lots of archaeology during activities such as quarrying in the area. So you know, there's apparent high density of evidence which appears to indicate focus of activity from the Mesolithic into the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. So previously flint scatters and structural remains have been recorded in the area. And what we wanted to understand was to what extent does this actually reflect a genuine preference for this river valley in prehistory? But also how does the activities relate to that in other contrasting environmental contexts elsewhere? Next slide, please. So I won't talk about Mesolithic flint scatters too much uh, because following on from this, Ian from Fusion will be giving a presentation on Jews Farm and the surrounding area. However, I will just mention this site that we've recently excavated along the New Year's Green Bourne in the Colne Valley. So the initial phase of works identified three potential areas of flint scatters. There were a thousand flint scatters plotted uh, for the largest spread in the initial cleaning and defining phase and over 1,900 were plotted in total. So we knew this was going to be a significant site. So then we went on to do 35 test pits were excavated by Wessex Archaeology over the larger spread um, during the second phase of these works. Um, an initial study of the flints revealed very few tools actually. So it's most likely that the East Greenbourne area was a pre-processing area for flint reduction purposes. So we had lots of broken blades, bladelets, core fragments, but we had very few microliths and scrapers. 
And in total, I think we had, it was over 4,650 4, pieces of work flint recovered from this amazing site. But I'll now pass on to John for the rest of the presentation. Okay, thanks, Emma. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, hi. So moving from the Mesolithic um, into the Neolithic and Early Bronze Age, um, we obviously had a number of objectives in our strategy related to these periods. Um, these, these kind of periods are characterised mainly by funerary and ceremonial monuments, um, as I'm sure you know, um, although the distribution of these varies um, considerably across the country and across the areas that we cross. In fact, very few, if any, were really known within the HS2 route um, at the outset of the project. Um, and this is also a period where it's, it's considered that there's still a high degree of settlement mobility in the uh, settlement pattern. So although there's kind of development of agriculture and things going on in this period, there's very few actually actual settlement sites as such that are ever identified. And, you know, that's been a bit debated frequently um, over the years. And, and, and the general kind of consensus is there's still kind of a lot of moving around in terms of the population in this period, even though the, uh, the sites of um, monuments um, are fixed. Um, so one way that we thought about approaching this, um, because, you know, the settlement is so difficult to identify, but we did think that the transect across the country that we've actually, that we're actually, um, you know, looking at, you know, gives us a potential to try and see if there's any kind of variation in that pattern, um, um, you know, across some um, significant kind of areas. So one thing we did think of doing was to um, look at the topsoil and look at the plough soil um, and sample that to see if we have any, you know, artefacts, um, essentially lithic tools um, across the route. So we did that at quite a lot of locations um, as part of our trial trench work. Before the trial trenches were dug, we, we dug some um, um, hand excavated test pits and we sieved, sieved the soil um, to look at that kind of distribution of artefacts. Um, it has to be said that the, the most successful area has been the Colne Valley around Hillingdon. Um, we, we've had um, quite a lot from there and very little else really moving north. There are some, some hot spots that we've recorded in um, Northamptonshire um, around the river, Great Ouse, but um, it's, it's been a fairly low level of material um, that's been identified. Plus we haven't had um, that many uh, ring ditches or monuments either. There's, there's been a few, but they've certainly been um, thin on the ground. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one exception to that is a site called Wellick Farm. In, um, it's near Wendover in Buckinghamshire. Um, here we, um, we found a, a timber circle, um, which, you know, as you can see from the image, is quite, quite spectacular. Um, and it's one of our key sites, really, for the late Neolithic and early Bronze Age. Um, there's actually, frustratingly, um, very little actual direct dating evidence at the moment. Um, there wasn't really any finds really from the post holes. Um, we do, however, have um, an assemblage of um, beaker pottery on the site, mostly from residual contexts, plus um, an assemblage of flint work. And um, I think there's also a, a stone mace head fragment, which could easily be late Neolithic or early Bronze Age. Um, plus we have um, a little bit further north of the timber circle, um, we have a penannular ring ditch, which had a crouched inhumation in it. Um, so I think, you know, at this stage, we're not absolutely certain of the date, but um, there's, there's further work to do in terms of, um, you know, trying to kind of establish a radiocarbon date. Um, from one or more of the features here so that we can actually tie this down a bit more. But what the assumption is it's kind of late Neolithic or early or early Bronze Age. Um, the rings of posts are quite interesting. It's been suggested by the excavators that, um, that the gap in the monument aligns on the midwinter sunrise. Um, and there was a smaller kind of group ring of posts um, towards the center. And um, also within it, we had um, to calf burials, which is which is kind of interesting, but no no human burials. Um, okay, next slide, please. 
So what I find really interesting about this site is that we have um, also have Iron Age and Roman activity. Um, and there's a kind of interesting kind of link with the earlier archaeology. So on this slide, you can see a kind of square enclosure. And within that is the Penanula ring ditch with the crouched inhumation. So although that burial isn't dated directly yet by um, radiocarbon, you know, it's been assumed that it's probably early Bronze Age. Um, and if so, it seems that the later Iron Age enclosure seems to respect it or has been, you know, um, set out with, with, with reference to it. Um, but the activity in the Iron Age, although there are there is some evidence for kind of, um, you know, agricultural use and land division across the area. There are also some unusual finds. There's been some votive deposits of coins, um, well, that, that's been interpreted as votive, um, also a spearhead, um, and I think a ring as well. So there's, so there's some quite interesting kind of potentially intentional deposits in this enclosure and the, and the uh, boundaries around this. Um, there, there was also um, a burial which made the press as a possible murder victim, but essentially it was a, it was a person that had been um, um, buried kind of face down, possibly with hands behind back kind of thing. Um, so, you know, there, there does seem to be um, some continued kind of ritual kind of use of this landscape. Um, the extent to which that landscape, you know, had any kind of significance following on from the kind of earlier Bronze Age phase is, is, is an interesting question um, because that period was obviously, you know, a thousand or fifteen hundred years prior to the Iron Age. But but it's but it's an interesting one. And um, next slide, please. And that goes into the Roman period as well. So um, we had quite an unusual and um, high status Roman burial, which was in a lead coffin. Um, and it, was, it had been inserted into the top of a backfilled well, which you can just about see in the center of this um, image. And um, it was set within its own enclosure. So it's a really, really interesting site. Um, if nothing else, it shows us the kind of, you know, ritual, um, and funerary kind of activities that were going on alongside kind of everyday settlement, but the, but there does seem to be kind of broader kind of themes um, coming out of this as well. Um, next slide, please. So, um, in terms of the evidence that we're getting across the route, um, the first sort of evidence for land division and, and kind of settlement um, as such seems to. Um, kick off in the kind of late Bronze Age or early Iron Age and some of the earliest features that we've had um, are pit alignments. Um, this is another example from Buckinghamshire um, where we have um, you know unusually managed to be able to get some data and evidence from from this. Um, so these are kind of like usually broad scale kind of land divisions. Um, sometimes they kind of cut off areas or they kind of respect the natural topography and um, on the photograph on the right you can see how our excavation trench disappears down to the river valley and that that's where one um, arm of the pit alignment you know extended kind of cutting off this kind of ridge if you like um, nobody really knows entirely the function of these um, of these features um, obviously you know pits have gaps between and, and they're not necessarily a physical barrier and there's been a lot of debate about whether they held posts or whether there was a bank adjacent to them or, you know, um, whether they actually formed a physical barrier or were more a kind of like conceptual kind of marker to people um, in terms of landscape division and territory. We don't really know, but, but this is an interesting one, um, quite unusual. It has a dog leg in the pit alignment and um, there were some features there with... Um, with um, Iron Age pottery as well, that it seems to be kind of respecting um, some kind of activity there. Next slide, please. And then another um, one of our kind of more earlier uh, forms of settlement that we've um, identified. Um, this is further north in Northamptonshire. Um, we've had um, at least two of these um, D-shaped enclosures, so-called D-shaped enclosures. 
which are they're quite substantial ditches and quite substantial enclosures but they're, they're quite small um, but they do seem to um, they do seem to have um, settlement evidence within them here there's a possible roundhouse um, on the left and, and, a, and a, you know a couple of other kind of features but they don't seem to be intensively or repeatedly settled over any great period of time I don't think but um but there's there's some of the more sort of earlier forms of settlement that we we've identified uh, next slide please um this is a kind of larger um example of settlement from from the middle iron age this is a so-called banjo enclosure that we found further north um at worm late in um in warwickshire um it's it's a really nice site um Obviously, you can see there's these kind of antennae ditches that kind of funnel into a kind of settlement, a circular settlement area. Um, I think the excavators have suggested there's more than one phase to this. I think possibly the um, circular um, settlement area um, predates the ditches, but um, that's something that we will be looking at further. Um, next slide, please. So. They were the examples of some of the earlier archaeology we've had on the route, but the bulk um, of the archaeology by far has been Iron Age, uh, late Iron Age and um, Roman um, settlement. Um, this image here is um, an aerial image with uh, features kind of overlaid. Um, you can see there how complex this is um, in terms of the organisation of the settlement and the kind of change over time. Um, so they're really quite complicated sites to excavate, lots of intercutting features, um, lots of finds, um, lots to think about in post-excavation. But um, we've been excavating these sites quite frequently along the route. Every few kilometres we're finding another and um, it, it, it will make a really, really um, good contribution and a good follow up to um, recent um, academic studies, such as the uh, Rural Settlement of Roman Britain project that was done um, by Reading University and Cotswold Archaeology um, a few years ago. So, so we've got a whole landscape of Iron Age and Roman settlement going all the way from, you know, um, Hertfordshire right the way through. And we're still finding settlement perhaps less um, extensively but all the way up into Staffordshire. Uh, next slide please. Um, yep yeah, so this is um, one of our more significant sites I think it's actually it's been in the media um, over the last few months um, for the Roman archaeology found at Black Grounds in Northamptonshire um, where we've we've got a fantastically well-preserved Roman site you know, we've got kind of um, stone buildings, wells, um, road roadways. Um, you know, it, it's a very, very well-preserved site. It was obviously very intensively occupied. Um, it's next to the River Cherwell, um, which it obviously relates to um, in some way in terms of the activity, and the trade and the settlement that was going on there. Um, and it's also adjacent to a known um, Roman villa. Um, which is outside of the root of the scheme. Um, but uh, what hasn't been publicised quite as much is the fact that adjacent to the Roman archaeology to the north is a vast swathe of Iron Age um, settlement um, that you can see on this slide. Um, typically Iron Age circular um, enclosures, roundhouses, um, and the, um, the dark kind of linear feature on the left is a hollow way. So. Um, extending down to the river um, to the south. So it's a really interesting site in terms of that kind of that change from, um, you know, that kind of progression from the Iron Age into the Roman period. And the character of the archaeology changes a lot too with the Roman archaeology, um, you know, very rectilinear, very kind of Roman feeling and the Iron Age kind of, you know, as you can see here. Um, and we're still actually excavating that site now. Uh, next slide, slide please. Um, so in terms of early medieval, as you'd expect, we haven't found as much. Um, we have found actually probably more um, burial sites um, than we thought we might do, but um, very few settlement sites. This one is uh, the North Portal um, of HS2 near Great Missenden, where we have a rectilinear possible Saxon um, 
hall building and uh, nearby is um, we found um, an inhumation burial as well which dates to I think the seventh or eighth century. Next slide please. Also with medieval most of our medieval evidence um, links to uh, ridge areas of um, ridge and furrow agriculture around um, uh, villages we haven't been able to date that particularly well. We'll, we'll keep looking at that in uh, post excavation in, in terms of whether we can see any kind of sequences in the uh, development of, uh, of the ridge and furrow systems. We also have a couple of uh, deserted medieval settlement sites, Lower Radbourne in Warwickshire and Doddershaw in Buckinghamshire, which is what is shown here, this multi-spectral image. We also have um, St. Mary's Church, which Guy uh, will be talking about later this afternoon. Next slide, please. Um, so one of our most significant kind of later medieval and early post-medieval sites is at Coles Hill in uh, Warwickshire, it's just east of Birmingham, um, where we've got um, quite an unusual octagonal moated site, um, which we did know about in advance. But um, what we didn't expect was we also, as well as the remains of the hall on the moat, we had a fantastically well-preserved um, garden archaeology. You can just about see here in the center of the image, those uh, four square areas are part of a uh, Tudor garden, which also just um, to the right of the image actually extended along the river. And we have kind of formal walkways and kind of planting beds and things. And uh, one of the specialists that visited the site said that it was kind of comparable to um, Hampton Court uh, in terms of the, um, quality of the garden archaeology so that was that was a nice um, a nice result next slide please and in terms of post medieval archaeology obviously we've got um various kind of um built heritage along the route which i'm not talking about um today um in terms of farmhouses and that type of thing but um one of our more spectacular sites was the um site of the former railway at Birmingham at Curzon Street and we found a um, roundhouse um, building kind of engine shed roundhouse coke vaults and all sorts of things associated with that which is really perfectly preserved underneath a concrete slab um, and this was built in 1837 as part of the London and Birmingham railway and we think it's the first of its type in the world so it's a really really quite interesting and significant industrial archaeology there um, and in terms of post-medieval archaeology obviously we have two major burial grounds one at park street in birmingham and the other at st james's gardens uh, near euston which um which we'll be talking about later as well uh, next slide please so in terms of where we are actually at um most of our excavation work is complete there'll be a little bit of ongoing work um this year but more or less most of our excavations are now complete and we are within the post-excavation um, assessment stage, which is a kind of formal stage of report writing. And um, once those reports are complete, um, all the um, archeology span and the artifactual assemblages will go into a further um, stage of post-excavation full analysis. And then ultimately, um, you know, that will, uh, that will result in publications and various kind of uh, media outputs as well. And um, ultimately, um, all our work will be archived on the ADS as well, the digital um, archive held at York. And um, the artifacts will be deposited with um, local museums. So I think I'm just about out of time. So thank you. Any questions? We have our HS2. Um, contact uh, details there for anything HS2 related. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Emma. That was uh, a really